if everyone is ready, is everyone good? I'll start the time now. Tens and I are firm. Wait, sorry, didn't start. <laughs> Tens and I are firm. Our first contention is a civil conflict catastrophe. Bahrain, a country with more than 7,000 US troops, is on the precipice of civil conflict. As Carbon 19 writes, the oppressed Shia majority is the next Middle East powder keg waiting to explode. US military presence makes civil conflict extremely likely for two reasons. The first is by promoting political repression. Jones 11 writes that during the 2011 Arab Spring, the Bahraini government committed atrocious human rights abuses. Unfortunately, he continues that it was the US military presence that made the government feel secure enough to act recklessly. Since then, Majazuk 20 writes, that Bahrain's human rights abuses have only worsened, and he confirms that this is due to continued U.S. military support. This makes the area rife for civil conflict, as Strand 16 quantifies, that as human rights abuses increase, the probability of civil war rises by 34% within a decade. The second is by encouraging Iranian involvement. Because of its proximity and geopolitical importance, Glazer 17 writes that U.S. bases in Bahrain represent a priority target for Iran. In fact, Geoff 20 reports that Iran has already begun funding numerous Shia militia as they see the area as a unique target of opportunity because of the U.S. Thus, our military presence has encouraged Iran to engage in Bahrain, which is detrimental, as Carpenter 19 finds that Iran can light the fuse to ignite Bahrain into a civil conflict. That's why overall, Aslam 10 quantifies that with every three years with U.S. military presence on national soil, the probability of civil conflict increases by 83%. The impact is a failed state. Carpenter 19 writes that Bahrain can become the next major conflict of the Middle East, similar to the civil wars in Syria and Yemen. This will be disastrous, as Golan 16 writes that civil wars are the worst form of conflict a country can experience because they destroy the internal economic and political institutions. That's why the civil wars in Yemen and Syria have already killed hundreds of thousands of people and plunged millions into poverty. Fortunately, this can be averted in Bahrain. If the US removes its military presence, the likelihood of civil conflict goes down and peace in Bahrain is attainable. Our second contention is removing the root causes. Quayle 18 writes, and since 2001, terrorist attacks have increased by 500% in the regions where the US has had the highest level of military involvement. US military presence in Arab states exacerbates terrorism in three key ways. The first is the Hydra effect. Dear 13 explains that US's focus in counterterrorism is using targeted killings to take out terrorist leaders. However, Deere continues that this only radicalizes terrorist groups even further because they rally behind the martyrdom of their leader. That's why Jordan 14 quantifies that killing a terrorist leader increases the probability of that group surviving by nearly 20%. The second is by emboldening repressive regimes. Jones 11 explains that allies like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain are emboldened to repre repress political dissidents through purges because US military presence makes them feel protected. That's why Slim 13 writes that American support for autocratic Arab regimes was a major factor behind the masses discontent with their government. This discontent breeds radicalization. It was like Schumacher 18 quantifies that a one unit increase in government purges doubles the number of terrorist attacks. The third is through anti-American sentiment. Frederick 18 writes that US troop presence foments radicalization because of its interventionist nature, which is why Ardo 9 writes that terrorist campaigns are specifically directed at ejecting foreign forces from their homeland, which the PSD 18 reports is their justification for 95% of all suicide attacks. That is why overall, Gobner 16 quantifies that for every 1,000 American troops sent to fight on the war on terror, there are 19 additional terrorist attacks. The impact is stunting development. Sandler 14 explains that these attacks have a damaging impact on the economy of these countries by scaring away trade, investment, and destroying the economic infrastructure. That's why Sinar 17 quantifies that a 10% increase in terrorism in a country decreases the GDP of that country by 5.2%. This is disastrous for the poor. Without investment and funds to develop the economy and create jobs, the poor lose any opportunity for social mobility. That is why the World Bank 15 quantifies that a 1% decrease in GDP increases poverty by 1.7%. Fortunately, by removing our military presence, we address the root causes of terrorism, providing a long-term solution for these countries. Thus, we affirm. Can I see your O'Rourke evidence and anything that it indicates the United States militarily involved itself in the Arab Spring in Bahrain, and... And uh, the... What was it for? Jordan, I'll put them in Zoom chat, what I'm looking the for. The Jordan evidence? Um, yeah, can I see that specifically, like, what the 20% increase is compared to? Oh, the 20%? Sure. I can send. Yeah. All right. So, O'Rourke about U.S. enabling human rights abuses. Okay. I asked for one more. I just got to go back and think about what it is. Give me one second to look at my flow. Um, 
Yeah, anything that says we militarily participated in the Arab Spring. Once Eli gets those, I can start constructive. Okay, I just sent the military presence allows them to commit human rights abuses. That was the first one. Yeah, that was the American yeah. involvement in the airstream. Um, I'm right, I, just took six, I just took six seconds of time, um, right there to type something. Uh, but um, So did you send all? Um, we sent one. Tenth is sending the 20% um, yeah. Jordan evidence. Which no, no problem. Said... Take your time. We, I just want to know. Also, wait. I just... What's the O'Rourke evidence you're looking for? The U.S. enabling any link evidence that the U.S. enables human rights abuses specifically? Sure, that's also that's also the Jones evidence that I just sent. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's chill. Oh, yeah, that's chill. The O'Rourke might have been something you guys read last time, but not this time. It's chill. My bad. Okay. Okay, I see Jones. I'm not going to start reading it until Roy's constructed. I'll just wait for the rest. So we're good? Eli? No, no, no. We still need a good amount of evidence. Okay. So right now, Jones and Jordan's coming. Awesome. Thank else? You. Okay. That's enough. Okay, I see Jordan. Three more seconds of prep taken, nine total. Roy, I'm good when you are. Okay. Did they send the evidence? You yeah, have I see evidence? Jordan now. Yep. Got it. Okay. In that case, this will be pretty slow because. I'm going to close my window, actually. Someone's very loud. OK. Everyone is ready. Time will begin now. Eli and I negate. Contention one is assuring our allies. Brands 15 of the FPRI rights. US force presence and security commitments have massively reduced the perceived need for America's allies to seek nuclear weapons. He continues, from Germany and Italy to South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, these aspects of US policy prove central to limiting the spread of nuclear arms. However, following public statements made against our security guarantees, Mackenzie 20 of Defense One writes, as the Trump administration scrambles traditional foreign policy practice, experts warn that some of America's longest allies are increasingly considering the pursuit of nuclear weapons weapons. Luckily, as of right now, McKenzie concludes the risk of allies rapidly nuclearizing is low. However, instantly abandoning seven critical allies in the Gulf would likely push nervous partners across the globe over the edge. Indeed, Brown 17 of Air Force University writes, although a, new, a nuclear proliferation strategy is currently a fringe idea for most U.S. allies, a significant retrenchment in U.S. security commitments could make these ideas viable, particularly for states facing highly acute threats. The reasoning is simple. As allies around the world watch us pull out of a region as soon as the going gets tough, they'll question our commitment to them in similar situations. Indeed, Brout, Heghammer, 20, the Washington Post finds the United States, European, and Asian allies already question whether they can rely on the U.S. nuclear umbrella in the Trump age. Possibly, possible states include South Korea, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Italy, Taiwan, and more. However, even if just one state proliferates, the results are calamity. Thayer, 95, of the University of Chicago explains, nuclear proliferation increases the possibility that nuclear weapons be used accidentally without authorization or by third parties. Thus, Kronig, 15, of the Journal of Strategic Studies concludes, nuclear proliferation contributes to a real risk of 
of nuclear war, even in a situation of mad among rational states. Contention two is protecting a friend. Pollock 20, the Washington Institute explains, if US troops stay in Iraq, they would counter Iran's malign influence throughout the region. But if they leave, Iraq would be at immediate risk of slipping back into destructive isolation with even less ability to resist Iran's predatory policies. Indeed, Nahad 20 of Brookings concludes, a US troop withdrawal would expose a weak Iraq to its powerful Iranian neighbor, concluding that Iraq would be handed over on a silver platter. There are three impacts to an Iranian takeover of Iraq. First is Kurdish genocide. Currently, six million Kurds live in Iraq. Unfortunately, Dalai 20 of Brookings writes, once the US umbrella is gone, the Kurds would be more at the mercy of Shia militias, Iran, and the central government. With nothing to stand in its way, Iran would likely crush the Kurds. As Franceman 70, the Jerusalem Post finds, today Iran views Kurdish aspirations and power as a threat to Iranian supremacy in Baghdad, as Kurds are mostly Sunni. Indeed, Kakarash 19, the Jerusalem Post warns, authoritarian states may invoke state sovereignty and national security to carry out ethnic cleansing and genocide against the Kurds. Second is financing. Pollock 20 writes, Iraq is now one of the world's top oil exporters with huge reserves. If the United States leaves, Iran would effectively gain control of increasing vast energy and financial resources, diverting them away from much needed Iraqi development in order to evade sanctions and greatly assist its own hegemonic ambitions. This would be devastating. As McKay 20 of Fox News finds the religious regime would spend any money financing offshore work ranging from Hezbollah and Lebanon and the Syrian government to militias in Iraq and Yemen. The third impact is crushing sanctions. Jihad 20, the war on, of war on the rocks furthers. If the United States does leave and disengages from Iraq, it will leave Iran with a more influential position in Iraqi politics. It will strengthen the Bina bloc, which campaigned on forcing U.S. troops out in the 2018 elections, and it will be a foreign policy achievement for the Iranian government. The hawks in the Trump administration who urged the president to escalate against Iran would decide that Iraq would be treated as an enemy, thereby necessitating sanctions. For Iraq, that would be the epitome of loss of sovereignty and create dangerous instability, pushing it towards a cycle of violence. Sanctions on Iraq have been horrific in the past, as Courtright 01 of the nation finds studies on sanctions in Iraq estimated the number of excess deaths among children alone to be 227,000. This would be far worse in the age of coronavirus. Look to Iran for an example. Osman 20 finds that because of an inability to access medical supplies and food, people, uh, if sanctions are not lifted on Iran, as many as 3.5 million civilians could die. Save lives and negate. I'm good for a cross. Um, can I ask for this question? Yeah. Okay. I'll start the time. Uh, now. Oh, sorry. Now. Okay. So, are all three of your impacts dependent on the link that Iran takes over Iraq? No. Okay, which ones are not? They're dependent on different kinds of takeover. Our Kurdish okay, so are Kurdish examples dependent? I'll go through them one by one. Sure. Our evidence about the Kurds indicates that even if there's no invasion, even if there's no increase in the number of militias, the present number of militias, as well as the Shia factions in the government, would oppress the Kurds if there was no U.S. We would say that this oppression does not require any invasion. It does not require anything along those lines. It, the number of militias right now, without U.S. there to stop them, would be enough to oppress them. Our second link on financing. The, the way this one works is a little more nuanced. So right now for like people of Iraq, the United States provides protection against militias and terrorist groups. When the US pulls out, they still need protection. So they turn to the Iranian proxies, which gives them influence over the people, the land, the resources in the land, and the people that they vote for. And the third impact is entirely separate. We don't need to win that anything on the ground happens. It's a perceptual argument that if the United States pulls out of the region, Trump will perceive it as a satellite state of Iran and sanction it. Can I take a question though? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. I, I hope that cleared everything up. Yeah, yeah. Cool. On your case, you say that the root cause of terrorism is an American presence, right? That it, it instigates a few of the root causes, yeah. Is that, it's one of the root causes, right? You would agree that like economic instability and like- We would say, we would say, we would say the massive drivers in the Middle East of terrorism are the three reasons that we list yeah. in our case. We'll, we'll contest that. You can take a question. Okay. So let's talk about your first contention. So you say that everyone is going to nuclearize the moment the U.S. leaves. So in yeah. 2019, when the U.S. was perceived to have leaving the Middle East and they decided yeah. to like take the pivot, why didn't all of these countries okay. then start to nuclearize? I can give you evidence that us pulling out of Syria led to an increase in discussions about nuclearization, but because we came back in less than a week and reaffirmed our commitment, it didn't trigger our impacts. But I can give you evidence that pulling out of Syria that tiny what step. What about in 2011 when we pivoted to Asia? Why didn't Why didn't we see nuclearization happen there? Uh, you can read all these scenarios and rebuttal. We'll like I'm just asking the, the historical process. Like question, you read though, this evidence, like, like they might yeah, do yeah. it. Like, I, I'm sure there's an answer for all of your scenarios. I already answered one. I'm going to take a question. Go ahead. On Bahrain, 
Yeah. Are we close to civil war in the SQUO? Yes. Okay. Uniqueness so is that's a, we we would contend that civil war is increasingly likely when the U.S. is in the area. Well, no, but you would agree that right now, like we're very close to civil war. Like it's it's easily triggered. We would say that it's still reversible at the point where the Shia oppress first when they can't even get funding no, from. I Iraq. understand your links. I'm just asking yeah. if it's close. Yes or no? Okay, you can take a question. I'll say, I'll say it's close. It's like nine seconds left. Um, why why do like the Iranian um, why do Iraqi people turn to Iran their enemy when the U.S. leaves? Why don't they? They're turn not their enemies. They're the Iran. same. Wait, wait, they're not enemies. They're the same uh, denomination. Iraq is predominantly Shia, and they need protection. It's like people need protection. It's Why not can't they get it from Saudi Arabia? It sounds. It's also three fifteen. Why can't Iraqis get it from Saudi Arabia? Uh, geography. Boring. We'll we'll take some prep um, as I get onto my the call with my partner. Um. We'll start time now. Okay, that was prep, it was 113. Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay, I'm restarting the time. Now, on their first contention about assuring allies, a couple of responses here. First is that global allies don't care about the U.S. pulling out troops in the Middle East as long as their own security agreements are protected. There's no reason why this goes away in the afterworld. But then second, there are other means of protection because we sell arms to allies like Saudi Arabia and we have diplomacy. They don't prove why it's uniquely our presence in the Middle East, a region that's completely different from the majority of the partners that they list that actually affects them. But then none of these countries are going to want to nuclearize specifically because of the massive economic and political backlash that would occur. Even if they would question our commitment, we can reaffirm it. They don't need to nuclearize. But then we would say that nuclearization is really, the probability of that happening is really, really low because they would destroy the relationships with the U.S. Our opponents don't prove they meet the bright line for them to A, perceive enough of a threat to actually start nuclearizing, and second, that the threat outweighs the remaining security guarantee that's still there and completely ruining decades on alliances doesn't make a lot of sense. But even then, Terrence of Nine says that mass nuclearization is actually a good thing because it causes everyone to go into gridlock. The mutually assured destruction forces everyone to not act. The chance in this calculation is really, really low. But on their second contention... First, we would say that the U.S. actually stokes rivalries in the region. We would contend that pulling out of our military partnerships in the Middle East allows us to become a more neutral actor. That's from The Guardian. But second, not only that, every time the U.S. influence has decreased, and the very last time that Middle East perceived a decrease in the security guarantee, they came to the diplomatic table. So alliances only happen in the Afro. That's exactly historical precedent. Proves our argument, but that's what happened in 2019 with Saudi Arabia and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar. That's from The New York Times, but more specifically on Iran. First, realize that Iran is not going to be interested in Iraq for three reasons. The first is because Iranian influence in the region has peaked and there's very little room for expansion. This is because they're already spread out into all the countries that they're able to influence and to whom their ideology appeals to, but they found themselves unable to expand elsewhere. They're not going to get any sort of leverage by taking over Iraq. But the second problem is that sanctions are putting them on the brink. Their oil exports have reduced by almost one half and their foreign investment is declining and there's been a 6% drop in GDP. That's really important because they don't have the physical ability to actually engage in other operations. They're focusing on themselves. But third is because these economic issues are coupled with political grievances. That's really important because it's led to the growth of a major protest movement in Iran with widening protests that demand change and they threaten the regime security. That's really important because it's forced Iran to like crack down and dissent and so they've taken a shift inwards. They have no interest in like in like uh, in like Ira Iraqi politics. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But even then the most important response is that Iranian foreign policy has shifted. It is no longer ideological but instead pragmatic. That means their endgame is just to never be overtaken and never lose the balance of power. It's not to actually intervene in the affairs of others. 
That is why overall Rover in 2017 confirms that no state in the region has the capacity to ever take over or influence another country. But on the impact level, their first thing is about a Kurdish genocide. But the problem is that Trump is not protecting the Kurds right now because we pulled out of Iraq and Syria. We stopped our support for them. Their argument is based on the false premise that we're still supporting the Kurds in the first place. That's not the case. But second problem is that Germany is the actual defender of the Kurds in, major in the majority of regions. Their support still remains in the app world. The resolution is not about German military support. But third, Trump and the uh, Trump has uh, like the U.S. has other ways of defending Kurds against like defending the Kurds in ways that don't actually require military involvement. They don't prove that that goes away in the app world either. But on their second impact about financing, there are a lot of problems here. First is because it doesn't really matter because the GCC creates massive alliances that actually prevent Iran from dominating any sort of market and getting too much revenue. That's really important. But second, they never prove that there are buyers that are actually available for Iranian oil. We would contend that the international community would completely sanction Iran. China themselves have said that they're going to look away from Iranian oil. They don't prove that Iran can actually get the money from this. But third, the U.S. has imposed massive secondary sanctions on Iran, so other countries are never going to buy Iranian oil. They don't prove that this happens. But on the third impact, they say sanctions on Iraq. But first, realize that we have already imposed sanctions on numerous officials in Iraq. Their argument is really not unique. But second, we have pulled out of numerous key bases in Iraq already, so they never prove when they meet the bright line for these sanctions. They never prove their perception like it's actually there. But third, Iran is able to mobilize their power in parliament based on anti-American sentiment because the parties aligned against Iran are in favor of U.S. interests. That's really important because that's why Iranian parties gain the most power when the U.S. took reckless military actions at the point where the U.S. pulls out and makes the pro-Iranian parties look weaker. So if the U.S. pulls out, they have less probability of actually engaging in Iraqi politics. Anyway, the only solvency is an R rule. But cross apply our response that Iranian foreign policy is pragmatic. It doesn't take much action to influence Iraq, but it makes no sense why the U.S. is going to impose sanctions and further destabilize Iraq if their goal is to combat Iran. And I see the evidence you read on like the turn about how, or like what was the turn about uh, it like hurts the Iraqi parliamentary whatever parliamentary like the turn on our, like turn on our uh, um it's basically that like iraq iran is able to mobilize their power based on anti-american sentiment if we leave that's good okay that's fine okay that was that's five seconds that was flex for a second uh let's start prep when i call you okay starting That was a minute 30 used. It's going to be my case than their case. Is anybody not ready? Then I will start now. Concede all the D-links on C1 to kick out of their turn. On our C2, a bunch of problems here. First, they talk about alliances, but you can turn this turn. The regional alliances they discussed would be built along sectarian lines. Iraq proves, despite being a Gulf state with a deep water port, they are excluded from the GCC as they are majority Shia rather than Sunni. Indeed, Marcus 19 of the BBC writes, the strategic map of the Middle East reflects the Sunni-Shia divide. Political alliances along sectarian lines cannot resolve conflict. Instead, they produce war. That's why Strand 16 of the NPS writes, the rigidity of divisions along sectarian lines is a dangerous source of conflict. Political responses to identity conflict become far more difficult under conditions of uncertainty, violence, and fear. Then group all the D-links they read about why Iran like won't try to take over Iraq. Okay, 
they are all basically hinging on the same idea that if Iran becomes more legitimate domestically, they can do all of these things. They can increase their expansion, the protests subside because the economy is doing better and these sanctions no longer put them on the brink. At the point where they can see the Pollock evidence that says Iran thinks it can get control of all of Iraqi oil if they invade, which then allows them to pass, skip by these sanctions, which they view as an existential threat, we say it's perceptual. Iran thinks they can solve all of these problems by invading Iraq, taking over the oil and dodging these sanctions they see as an existential threat. Then on Kurds. First, they say Trump is not protecting the Kurds. Sure, that's true. The only reason he has bases in Iraq is to like fight terrorism and fight Iran and other stuff like that. But and that takes out their third response because they say the US has other ways. Trump has no incentive of doing those other ways. On Germany, Coffin 20 says that if the US pulls out, it's likely other coalition allies will too. Ger Germany is a coalition ally. Then they say that the GCC stops like Iranian dominance for oil. We again say it's perceptual because sanctions are an existential threat. Iran is going to to try it because they're in a try or die to dodge these sanctions. Then they say there's already sanctions. They say it's just a couple of officials. We say it's scalar. The more sanctions, the more people die. Then they say we're already pulling out. No, we're not. We're just consolidating bases in the southern part of the country. Then they're saying Iran mobilizes the Iraqi parliament with US sentiment. We say that's easier in the affirmative world because all of the American supporters in their pol parliament get really upset and like see, see the US as betraying them and then decide to join with the Iranians on their case a bunch of responses here. First, D-Link it. In the Arab Spring, we told Bahrain that we would not intervene and fight the protesters. Our presence does not enable them to repress. They were able to do that on their own. The only thing that changes about their ability to kill their own civilians in the world of the AF is we lose leverage that is restricting them in the SWO. Brands of the SSI in 2015 writes, the more U.S. troops are stationed in a country, the more closely that country's foreign policy orientation aligns with that of U.S. Human rights get worse in the AF without U.S. leverage. We have the best risk of stopping these human rights abuses. There is a, another turn on their civil war argument because if they perpetuate more human rights abuses, they increase the likelihood of uprising. This also turns one of the warrants on terrorism about governmental purges. Another turn. GC states like Bahrain empirically get more aggressive when we withdraw. Pollock 15 of Brookings writes, in the absence of American military involvement, the GCC states get frightened and their tendency when frightened is to lash out. The unprecedented, unprecedented GCC air campaign in Yemen is a striking example of this. As the Arab Gulf states see it, the United States has never been so disengaged from the reason, region. Prefer this evidence to their argument about presence emboldening allies as our presence is the lowest it's been in 35 years, but allies are engaged in more conflicts and human rights abuses than ever before. Then, on their link about Iran, if Iran wasn't funding militias in Bahrain, they'd fund them elsewhere. Then, on their C2 about terror. First on Wang, all of their terrorism arguments come from Iraq. Thus, any one of our scenarios on our second contention would trigger the exact instability and economic devastation that breeds terrorism. This is especially true for our argument about sanctions. Their 500% increase in terrorism supercharges the prerequisite because at the point where there were like six wars in the Middle East in the past 20 years and terrorism has increased 500%, we would say that's a clean prerequisite there. But then, turn this argument, pulling out of the region makes it harder to collect intelligence. Kirkpatrick and Schmidt of the New York Times in 2019 found that Trump's pullout handed ISIS its biggest in four years because it was harder to collect anti-terror intelligence. Then, turn it again. Pulling out causes terrorism. Brands of the SSI in 2015 writes, terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda prosper amid instability and security vacuums. Such instability and vacuums, in turn, unwittingly can be encouraged by the premature withdrawal of U.S. military power from troubled areas. Uh, negate. Uh, if anyone needs to see, like, the last card where I sped up, I can send that in the email chain. But if can not, we, we're ready. Can we problem. can we see the evidence that um that we're not pulling out of troops right now? We're just consolidating bases. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me call Roy and see where that evidence is. Uh, um, here. I can get it. Give me one second. Give me one second. Yeah. You found it? Yep. Okay. Thanks.
I'm just going to cut it for you guys. the link and here's the cut card thanks for us no problem yeah i'm ready for cross as soon as y'all are i'm highlighting right now sorry Boop -boop. Okay, it's sent. Okay. Okay, are y'all ready for, or are you ready for cross? Okay. Your mic is off. Wait, did, did you guys send evidence? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can start cross while he's looking at the evidence. Sure. Okay, so pass. Okay, so just a clarifying question: What was the second turn you put on Bahrain? On, um, I'm sorry. What was the second turn you guys put on Bahrain? Oh, it was that like, right now because we lose leverage, their repression gets worse, and the civil war becomes more likely. Can I take yeah. a question? Yeah, of course. Okay, so on your Iran link for Bahrain. Does, like, is Iran, why would Iran stop trying to, like, gain influence out in Bahrain if the U.S. pulled out? If the U.S. pulls out, then they have no capital to do so because no one, because the government abuses get worse. If there's, if there's nothing to be mad at, then there's nothing to fund. Okay, can I have a question? No, wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, okay, so, really if, so the link chain is this. The U.S. leaves then Bahrain is not emboldened to commit any more human rights abuses. And at the point where our presence has been there for a long time and human rights abuses have only gotten worse, that, I don't know, that, that takes out your leverage turn, A? No, wait, no, I that's not, I'm not asking about the leverage turn. No, I know that. Say I Iran, know. wait, you say Iran wants more power in Bahrain, correct? Um, what we're saying is that Iran sees that they're on the precipice of civil conflict, and so that's why they're funding militia in Bahrain. If the incentive for people, yeah, because of the okay. U.S. bases there. So the yes, US Iran wants more influence in Bahrain, correct? No, if correct. The, the problem is, it's because the U.S. is there. If the U.S. leaves, then A, they don't they don't have the incentive to do so anymore, and B, they don't have like, okay. the people to do it with because the people are not going to be when like there's, when there is no support. when the U.S. pulled out of Lebanon in the 1990s, did Iran stop trying to get influence there or start getting more influence? How many bases were in um, Lebanon? I mean, we were part of an Israeli occupation for a brief okay, period. Can I ask you a question now? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, so your link is perception on your case, right? One of them is. We say that it's try or die for mm -hmm. Iran because they see the sanctions as an existential threat, so they're going to exhaust every possible option. Yeah, okay. So does Iran, okay, if, there's an, if, it, it, if it is an existential threat, why don't they attack it right now? attacks oh because the u.s is there they can't compete with a massive well-trained army like the u.s okay. they're increasing attacks our uniqueness evidence says they're increasing iranian presence in the region but they okay, can't fully invade if the u.s is there so your argument is invasion part of it is what Wait, okay so Mike, i mean roy explained this in first cross but i'll go through it again one of the links is invasion. We say okay. that Iran will want to invade Iraq to get control of their oil. The other link is that if the U.S. pulls out, that massively increases support for Iran in Iraq because they want protection from a larger regional power, which means that Iran gets more influence and the U.S. Sure. sees them as a puppet state of Iran and then imposes massive sanctions. So you don't fall into the fact that Iranian that's, foreign policy is shifted. Okay. That's cross. Wait, what don't I front line? Whatever, we'll talk about it in rebuttal. And so okay. Right. Um, we'll start prep again once I get on the call. Wait, wait. Can I see some evidence really quickly? No. Uh, which evidence? Can I see human rights abuses have gone up since American presence in 1968? Oh, the evidence is that 
Okay, it's we have that human rights abuses have worsened in Bahrain. Do you want to see that? That's, that's fine. evidence we read. Hmm? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'll get that. I just sent the evidence, by the way. Awesome. I'll just look at it during your, actually, I'll follow your speech, so I'll look at it after. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll begin prep then once we get on the call. But we'll start time. The, yeah, so we took 148, so we have 10 seconds left. Yeah. Right. I'm going to start. I'm going to start on the turns in our second. I'm, I'll, sign, I'll sign points as I go. I'll start on the turns in our second contention, then go to their case. Is everyone ready? Everyone good? All right, I'll begin the time. Now, starting the first one, they say that we lose leverage and we can't prevent human rights abuses. They draw up the news that Majuk says that human rights abuse is only increasing. Obviously, we're not using it. They have no offense here. But the second turn, group, they, they say that GCC allies are going to lash out. The problem is it's not his true, true historical. They dropped the Guardian evidence that Tencent reads you. That in 2019, when they thought that the U.S. was leaving the area, they didn't lash out in the area. They instead formed alliances, Saudi and Qatar, formed alliances, Saudi and um, UAE, formed alliances, all of that happens. But that gets me to their third term. On the secretarian lines, that's on their second contention. They say the secretarian lines produce war. But the key thing that they drop is the New York Times and the Tencent sites that says that the secretarian lines are not what's happening right now. Look, last year, Saudi Arabia and Iran, on the secretarian lines, different um, Muslim uh, organizations came to the negotiating table when the U.S. left. The reason why is because they also dropped the Guardian evidence that says that the U.S. stokes the rivalries in the area, which is why they're actually being put on different sides. When the U.S. leaves, they can act as a more neutral ally. That gets you diplomacy. That kicks out of their secretarian turn. But then on their case, they're really not winning it. They try to group all of the responsible 
why Iran can't like, get into Iraq because Iran thinks that they can get into order. But, but the problem is first, perception does not matter if they don't have the ability to do so. The point where sanctions have made them lose the fiscal capacity to actually gain any type of influence in Iran, which they never respond to Rovner, who explicitly says they cannot get influence in any other state. They have no offense around it. It does not matter about perception. But third, even if you want to talk about the legitimacy of the area, they drop the fact that the political grievances in Iran is specifically about Iran trying to expand elsewhere. That's exactly what's undermining the legitimacy of these regions. That's why you see that they are turning inwards. That's exactly why their foreign policy, crucially, has shifted inwards. They're not looking to try and expand elsewhere. But then, on their impacts anyway, on Kurdish genocide, they can see that Trump has already pulled out, so the US has nothing to do with it. But then they say that Germany's going to pull out too. We called for the evidence in the last round too, and it has nothing to say about Germany. We would say Germany specifically stays because they have hundred decades of long relationship with the Kurdish allies. They're always going to be sent. But then, on the sanctions argument, they're really not winning it either. They say to our response, we've already pulled out of several key bases in the area that were consolidating bases. We called for the evidence. It also concludes the same thing that we pulled out troops. At that point, you have no idea what the bright line is for when we put, impose sanctions, but because we would would say that is much more destabilizing if the U.S. Um, imposes sanctions that hands Iran to a civil platter. That's going to happen. But then go to our case on terrorism. They say that's a prereq because Iran foments terrorism. Not true. Terrorism in all types of places, not just ISIS. But then they say conflicts cause war. But we would say terrorism prereqs in two ways. The first is because terrorism breeds domestic instability. That incites conflict. But second is because terrorism creates poverty. When you're poor, you're more likely to descend against the government. That's why another link into conflict right there. But then they read another turn saying that there's more in. We lose intel. First, we've already trained Iraqi forces. They can gather intel. But the, uh, uniquely, the American true presence foments the anti-American sentiment. But second, if we saw the root causes of terrorism, we don't need to get intel. Third, they say that there's going to be power vacuums. So if they say, first, coronavirus has actually put down the terrorism at the best time. This is the best time to actually leave the region. And second, they can't fill the power vacuum because the situations are so much different than before. That's why you see that like um, ISIS can't fill in because these, you should, the Iraqi government's not co combating the Sunnis in the same way. That's why you can send the Jones, uh, the US radicalization evidence, which causes 95% of terrorist attacks. And that's why every 1,000 troops we put in puts in 19 terrorist attacks. That's why you see economic development get destroyed in the long term if you have a 10% increase in terrorist attacks, decreases GDP by 5.6%. Okay, we'll take prep. I'm just going to call Roy and we'll start as soon as he picks up. Starting now. Yeah, yeah, because I couldn't, I couldn't, I extended like at the very end. And I'm muted. All right, just to check, so, so that was 54 seconds. The evidence you referenced in summary about abuses going up is the same evidence you sent me, correct? There is no other evidence? Yeah, that's, that's just the most recent evidence. Yeah. That's the evidence? Yep. The most, okay, cool. One more question. Can I see Saudi Arabia and Iran formed an alliance? Oh, it's that they're negotiating right now because the US left. I'll, show, I'll send you that evidence. That's fine.
Wait, do you want to see the Guardian evidence as well or just the Saudi Iran specific? I just want to see evidence that indicates Saudi Arabia and Iran formed an alliance. Okay, just sent it. Okay, I'll start prep when I get it. All right. Thanks. That was three seconds. All right, Eli and I will run prep again once I call him. We have like eight seconds left. Okay. The order is going to be the weighing dispute about who prereqs who, followed by the leverage turn, and from there I will signpost. Is everyone ready? Wait, where are you starting? The dispute on prerequisites. Does terrorism prereq or does war prereq? Okay. Is everyone ready? Time starts now. We are winning the prereq dispute. When ISIS was at its highest, it still didn't start very many wars. There were already wars. The Syrian civil wars, what led to the rise of ISIS. Wars empirically always lead to the rise of powerful terrorist factions. Their own evidence concludes that they missed that implication. But terrorist groups, even when they're at their most powerful, do not cause enough instability to cause wars. Rather, it's the opposite. For, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran work together to defeat ISIS. It does not cause wars. It causes alliances and peace treaties to defeat the terrorists. It doesn't cause wars. We are winning the prereq clash very cleanly. Go to the leverage turn. We say from brands that the more troops you have in a region, the more more leverage you have to prevent things like human rights abuses. They say that abuses have gone up. Their evidence is from 2011, and it says in one specific instance of a few months, the Arab Spring, there were more human rights abuses. Obviously, there were more, but they can see that we did not condone or enable those whatsoever. That means that the only risk of offense, the only comparative here is that when we have fewer leverage, there'll be more abuses. They're losing out on the comparative. There are, There is the propensity for there to be more abuses. In fact, in the status quo, Amnesty International finds that they are releasing prisoners from the Arab Spring. Our leverage is working. It didn't work in the Arab Spring, but it has worked the entire time. The comparative is really clear. A, more leverage, fewer human rights abuses, turns their civil war link. B, she explains in Cross that the more human rights abuses, the more likelihood there is of a civil war. So they have a higher likelihood of triggering that entire impact extended through. It causes massive conflicts, it causes massive terrorists and invokes, like implicates the entire region because it's literally a religious divide between Bahrain and the GCC and Iran, which causes terrorism throughout the region, outweighs on scope and magnitude. Previous uh, wars between Sunni and Shia have killed literally millions. Look to Iran versus Iraq. But then secondly, it turns terrorism. They concede the implication that with less leverage, we cannot stop purges as effectively. And their second warrant is that purges cause terrorism. This non-uniques their link about anti-American sentiment causing terrorism because purges cause terrorism. And it also means that we are the best link into preventing terrorism. They have very little offense here because there's very little uniqueness. With less leverage, there are more purges and more terrorism. Now, go to my case. They extend a few things. First, they said there's no capacity and they're turning inwards. Three responses. One, the Wallace evidence from case frontline system says that there are more uh, conflicts in the scope. Iran is moving more proxies to Iraq than ever before. Obviously, they're not turning inwards. But then secondly, the reason why they're going regardless of with or without the United States there, they're always going to go because they always need to get oil. Clearly, they have the capability. They're increasing proxies. We do not need to win a full-scale invasion. We say that the number of militias there right now is enough to control the oil fields and is enough to gain leverage in parliament if there's no U.S. counterbalancing. 
extend the link on sanctions. We say that the United States fears that once we are not stopping Iraq or Iran and the proxies they have there in the squo, we think it's a puppet state. And we've always sanctioned things like Hezbollah and every other puppet state of Iran. That means that we impose sanctions, which they can see it kills 3.5 million Iraqis. This outweighs everything they talk about, A, because they don't extend an impact in summary, and B, because it's on severity, because all they implicate is like poverty. That's nothing compared to 3.5 million lives. And on magnitude, because it's way more than their amount of terrorism effects. And more importantly, it also turns their link because sanctions can uh, trigger anti American sentiment way worse than just a minor amount of presence, which means that you see A, it's non-unique, and B, the economic instability from sanctions triggers massive amounts of terrorism. Their link is about Iraq. We impose sanctions on Iraq. They're losing the comparative. It's over. I'll start the time now. Did you read the evidence that we sent you on the date that it was on it? 2011 is the date. The Majzub evidence that I sent you? Majzub 20, from you said February 25th, 2020. This is the evidence that we said the human rights abuse. Okay, sure, from February 25th? Yeah, no, no, no. our Amnesty International is from April 6th. It says okay. that right now leverage. So they released like a couple more, but the general- No, they released 1,500 prisoners okay. and 900 of them were given pardons by the king. Great. Also, they are releasing political sure. dissidents and pardoning them for their crimes in the status quo. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait. Okay. Also, I mean, you 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 evidence? Can I respond? The problem wait, really with this. Can okay. You yeah. can respond. Okay. The problem with that is that that's one specific instance, and the reason why people are like helping each other right now in like currently is because of coronavirus. But overall, the oh, general yeah. truth is that that's one. Yeah. And that's that's our evidence that's spikes that. Our evidence spikes that because it says, yeah, yeah, coronavirus is the reason they were released from prison. They could be put in house arrest. But they were given pardons by the king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were told so where, where yeah, has been absolved. Question. That isn't necessary to hedge against coronavirus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question: Does your evidence say the U.S. anywhere? Because right, it does not matter. The narrative is the only evidence that says the U.S. has yeah, yeah. any use of leverage yeah, yeah. for it's using it in any way. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't matter. We don't yeah, need to. Matter. Your okay. argument is that the U.S. uses leverage to get right. Right. them to like be better. Right. If coronavirus is the reason why they're being better, then you have no turn, right? Right. It doesn't matter. We don't need to worry about the trajectory of human rights abuses. As I said in my summary, you're losing the comparative. Even if they're increasing, we say that without leverage, they'd be increasing faster. Empirics do not disprove. There are all. Wait, wait, wait. Can I finish? Can I finish? There can be reasons why human rights abuses have risen. That doesn't mean leverage is failing. It just means that they would have risen more without okay. leverage. You have okay, not okay. Here's my question. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. You concede from Brands that there is leverage. Your no, empiric not. Proof does Your not respond. Is super general. Ours is the only one specific to the Middle East. No, you that's just say they're not the using leverage. That's your response. That's your front line. Huh? Leverage stuff. Okay. First, uh, evidence doesn't say the United States and your turn doesn't matter because at the point, that's only correlation. If human rights abuse are decreasing and there's nothing that says that it's the U.S. leverage specifically right. that yeah, makes it to be the Yes, we do. Yeah. We have the only evidence that says U.S. military presence is the reason why allies act recklessly. Only yeah, act reasons. recklessly, not commit that's human rights abuses. That's, that's like six article paragraphs article. down in your evidence. Just because you paraphrase them together, together doesn't mean they're all causal. All the articles about human rights abuses. All of them. Wait, wait, you, right. you literally conceded out of- the card wait, 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 and you guys wait, wait. are not- reading it like yeah you you conceded out can i respond you conceded out of rebuttal that the united states did not help them in the arab spring and does not support them in killing human rights or do, perpetrating but human no, rights we issues. say that they are oh. supporting them implicitly that's no, our entire you, argument you literally drop the contention because you concede that the united states did not help them do these abuses and your evidence is in specific and the leverage turn is the only comparison wait, wait, wait also also, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Even if you respond to this part of Bahrain, you don't extend an impact on Bahrain, and this does not respond at all to purges. We still have leverage that stops purges. We still okay, turn. We have to the side, you have leverage to stop purges that is being used. That's our front line. We say we never use the leverage. Even okay. if brands have we know that's your front line and that's cross, but the analysis we make that's dropped is that it's the only risk of use is. Analysis. You use this is against so you your argument. That. That, like, doesn't matter. That, that's cross. We have 10 seconds of prep. We're going to run it.
That's that's ten. So we can. Okay. Can I don't can you yourself? Okay. I'm gonna be starting on our case. I'm gonna be starting on our case. Okay. Starting the time. Now they make a big mistake when they put zero defense on our case. Our link is really clean. Frederick 18 says that our presence foments radicalization in Middle Eastern countries. This is really important because that's why PSD finds that 95% of all suicide attacks are to get rid of foreign entities specifically. That's so important because our governor evidence, this takes us to our impact. Our governor evidence says that every 1,000 troops causes 19 more terrorist attacks. This goes clean conceded. That stunts development because it scares economic investment and it scares foreign investors from investing in. There were, we're outweighing on strength of link here because they put literally zero defense on the it's the cleanest place to vote. That's why every 10 attacks decrease the GDP by 0.3% and a 1% decrease in GDP increase the poverty of people by 1.7%. That's really clean. That's why we're going to be outweighing their only response to the entity round. Honestly, it's just a bunch of turns. But the problem why their leverage turn doesn't really work with our terrorism contention is because our evidence is from 2020. And Maz Jube said that human rights abuses, the general trend is that they've been increasing even though the U.S. is there. The better, the way, the reason why you prefer our evidence over theirs is because it says the U.S. specifically. That's really important because their evidence is just correlation at best at the point where they don't prove that the U.S. is the actor that is causing them to have the, that, that the U.S.'s leverage is causing them to reform, is, is causing them to actually perform these reforms. And it doesn't really matter because we're the only ones who perform the cause analysis and the point where the general trend is that they that they performing abuses you can't really buy this trend it doesn't link to any of the purchase responses that's really important because we're going to talk about why they're we're outweighing in two ways the first is urgency because i know says in summary what goes conceded is that coronavirus has hit terrorists the hardest the only point to cut the root cause of terrorists is right now we have to make sure that we take care of them right now and the only way to do so is not because they're really weak right now but the second is on time frame because we're impacted the long term because terrorism destroys economic growth that's really important because their case doesn't really matter because they never respond to the vote evidence which says that no country can gain influence over others. That's really important. It goes conceded. That's really important because foreign policy in Iran has shifted inwards political. They never respond to the fact that sanctions have caused them at the point where they don't have the fiscal ability and they don't have the ability because of protests in their country to actually conquer another one. It doesn't really matter. But that's really important because none of their weighing doesn't, like none of the prereq doesn't matter. But also, also, we pulled out of the area in Iraq anyways. Where's the bright line for all of their impacts happening? And also, our present extend the term that our presence is actually causing diplomacy right now. That's why Saudi Arabia and Iran are talking. All right. We have nine seconds. I'm going to call Eli, and then we'll start. Starting. All right. Okay. It's going to be their case, our case. Start on their case, call for our brand's evidence. It's really good. Not only does it say we get leverage, but it says that the policies of the countries with more U.S. troops ingre increasingly mirror ours. At the point where the U.S. doesn't do crazy human rights abuses, you know that the only risk of preventing human rights abuses in Bahrain is keeping troops there. So we have some risk of leverage stopping these human rights abuses. That's why you're seeing it from the most recent evidence that they pardoned 901 political dissidents. That's from this month. Their evidence is from like three months ago. Prefer ours. Then we say leverage is the best risk of stopping purges, which is their link into terror, which is one of their links into terrorism at the point where the U.S. can, through leverage, stop uh, stop purges, which increase terrorism through repression. We say that we can short circuit their terrorism con contention there, and it's not a reason to vote for them. Right there, you can outweigh on scope and magnitude because the U.S. presence is the best risk of stopping these repressive purges, which lead to overall terrorism incre increases. We co-opt all of their impacts. Then on our case. Start on our Wallace evidence, it tells you that proxies are increasing in the status quo and so is Iranian leverage. And so long as the U.S. is there, we can effectively counterbalance it by removing the U.S. And we are not leaving in the status quo. Our evidence is really explicit. We're consolidating into some basis. Uh, as, as long as the U.S. is there, they cannot gain the adequate hold. That is really good because if they gain the sufficient leverage to make Trump think they are a puppet of Iraq, then he plasters them with sanctions. Even if, if, even if there are already sanctions in the status quo, they can see that these sanctions are scalar, which are evidence that is clean conceded. So if you 
you want to weigh on strength of strength of link, you can look right here because they have never responded to the impact scenario in and of itself. Kills 3.5 million people. That is not, it's also the most contextualized. They extend nothing but nebulous numbers. You don't know where to vote for them. You vote for us here. Then we outweigh on magnitude because they just say 19 terrorist attacks increase. You don't know how many troops are in the Middle East. You don't know how many terrorist attacks are increasing overall. We tell you 3.5 million people will die if they can't get access to medical supplies because of sanctions. Then we say this also short circuits their, uh, to terrorism because sanctions trigger, like, yeah, trigger anti-U.S. sentiment by causing economic instability. The only way to vote is for the negation. Good round, y'all. Good round, everyone. Uh, the judges want to see uh -huh. any evidence or no? Um, can I see the, I think it's Branson card, uh, yeah, which yeah, the name, so uh, the one you, yeah, yeah, I'll send it in the, uh, in the, email. I already got it, Eli. Oh, okay. It's already in. Is that the only card? Oh, uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Do you want to see our evidence about that or no? Um, I mean, actually, yeah, you can send it too. That'd be great. Thanks. Ooh. The Brant's evidence is just the evidence that says the U.S. has leverage when they have troops in the area, right? Yeah. It says that their policy says mirrors are. Well, do you want to announce, given your seniority? Stoops. Yeah, I can't. Uh, the decision was a 2-1 for Bethesda Chevy Chase. I was a squirrel, so I'm going to go first. Oh. oh. <laughs> Again, below? Okay, um, I didn't need to call for cards because my, my role as, as adjudicator is I really do think that you guys should clarify things within the round. So if I'm not clear on a card, it's your fault by the end of the round. So I don't want to call because I think that's inherently some kind of interventionist. But so I'm going to go on what I saw the round as. Um, two places to vote, in my opinion, or like to look at to evaluate to vote. I think it was the Iran Iraq sanctions and then the terror argument. Um, on the Iran Iraq sanctions argument, I just think there's way too much defense. Like, I'm not sure if the other judges voted off this argument. I just don't, I can't vote off this argument, right? There's a couple of places where I think you guys are doing well, right? Which is this uniqueness stuff about, you know, the Iran proxy and the status quo and that, you know, you, you, uh, United States consolidating, you know, eventually Iran will take over, which, you know, leads to the, I get the whole scenario. My biggest problem is that you guys don't answer any of the Iran domestic stuff, right? It's pretty cleanly extended in first summary and second, uh, or in, in first final focus as well. He told me that perception doesn't matter because they literally can't get access to the territory across uh, their Romer card. And they told me the political grievances domestically mean that, like, even if they want to expand, that's what causes people to, like, cause, the, like, the domestic government to focus on domestic issues because of the political grievances that happen from the expansionist policy. So, like, if they can't afford to be, you know, a prolonged conflict or proxy in Iraq, and if, you know, they have to focus on domestic issues, I'm not really sure how we get to the United States to put sanctions on Iraq because of what's happening you know, in the status quo or whatever. I just don't know how we get there. A lot of defense, I don't think there's any sufficient responses. So I'm just not comfortable voting off of it, even if the defense is in terminal. Then I look on your side of the flow or their side of the flow and for the terror argument, I think you guys do a lot of like technical work in terms of outweighing what the pre wreck the prereq analysis, but I'm not sure you actually address any of the real responses. I think there are some clean extensions coming out of the argument, right? This idea that, that troop presence generally creates some anti-US sentiment or creates some radicalization or at least is some increase in terrorism. I don't think the Brands card is actually responsive, right? Because if Bahrain, there are increases in human rights abuses, even if you guys point to an, a, a recent evidence that says that like this one example of, you know, getting 1,500 people out of, you know, 900 of them were led to free, it seems like there 
evidence looks at holistic trends since the Arab Spring and it's saying that like it's gotten worse. Like human rights abuses have just gotten holistically worse. Insofar as that's true, I feel like they have better clarity of 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 the of, of the terror argument in terms of like what the situation in um in the Middle East looks like in terms of addressing uh, political dissent or terrorism. It seems like U.S. troops are the big cause for the terror increase. If a thousand troops um, lead to 19 more attacks, that's a lot more clear for me than like when Iran uses proxies, maybe Trump puts on sanctions, maybe that leads, like this is a lot more clear that like U.S. presence leads to some form of radicalization. Maybe the, uh, the converse is true that you guys tell me that U.S. has some leverage in these situations, but that doesn't mean terror doesn't exist or doesn't go up in there. I, it, I, there's less defense on the terror argument than there is on your argument, so I vote off of terror. Um, I can go next then, I guess. So similarly, I look at the same arguments, um, the terrorism and the like Iraq sanctions. So on terrorism, I ultimately do buy the neg Lincoln um, through this card. I, I guess my problem with the card is that I think the analysis that they make that like, even if we're not seeing human rights abuses explicitly like go down, it's really the only chance we have and there's that risk of solvency there is enough for me to give them this link because the only response I really hear is that like our, ca our card does the causal relationship, but I don't think you actually engage with the argument they're making about risk of solvency. So it's enough for me to grant the neg link there on terrorism. Um, that being said, I do agree that I think there needs to be more engagement on the link level. Like there's a lot of time spent on the impact level and weighing that when you both are functionally linking into the same terrorism impact. So I don't think it's that strategic for either side to spend that much time like explicitly weighing the impact when you're both going for a link into it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, I think, especially with only two minutes of final focus. Um, so then in terms of the sanctions argument, I ultimately do think there is enough frontlining. I think this Wallace card is really not engaged with um, insofar as Sure, you make the argument that like they don't have the ability to do this long term because of like the political differences and because of the sanctions and the status quo. But the Wallace card tells me that they're there now and it's enough to trigger the link that they make about Trump seeing it as a puppet state um, and putting sanctions in, in the status quo. So that gives me enough of an impact. I think for both impacts I end up voting for, I wish there was more done in terms of like internal link weighing and really making sure that the extensions there are good. There's a lot of time spent on the impact level for things that I really don't think are that relevant because um, you're basically going for the same impacts most of the time. So I think more focus on the link level. Um, but yeah, that's where I vote. Yeah, I echo most of, I don't know if I'm, is it Pia? Yeah. I echo most of what, what Pia said. I think I also defaulted to two big issues of Iran, Iraq and terrorism. So starting off on, um, on sort of, uh, the, the argument, the, the big clash around human rights abuses. So I think in the specific case of Bahrain, given that Bronx had more specific evidence, I, I bought their analysis with Bahrain specifically, but I think the rest of the Middle East, I defaulted on, um, on brand because I thought that that was, that was general enough and there wasn't really characterization in those scenarios. And that's a holistic time series longitudinal study that can take into account more of the region. So even if I do give you guys um, the, the human rights abuse link there. The sec, the, I thought that Khan cast enough doubt and judgment, this is what Pia was also mentioning, where it, it could be worse if the US wasn't there. Um, and so there's the, uh, yeah, because there's, there's risk of solvency. And so um, because I default rest of the Middle East leaning to, to Khan as well as risk of solvency, I think that casts, um, I think that sort of mitigates some of the offense coming out of w what I thought was your, your best offense. Uh, and then on Khan, I actually bought, I think similar to what Pia was saying, the Wallace evidence, I think it's, it takes into account uh, the fact that Iran has had a shitty economy and they have domestic problems because it's 17 days ago. So 17 days ago, Iran had the same problems and is there's still evidence that they have, um, they have strong militia forces inside of Iraq. And so I thought that that was sufficient to subsume a lot of your responses on it. And, and therefore I was able to, to buy the scenarios even if they, the probability was, was lower because of the defense you put on it, of, of, Iraq, of Iraqi sanctions and the aggressions and, and downstream lives, lives there. And so I think that that was sufficient enough for me, but yeah, similar to what Bilal and, uh, and Pio were saying, I think there were, there were some, some extensions through Inc and, and weighing on the link level, uh, weighing analysis on the link level could have, could, have been, could have been better, but all in all, I thought it was a great round. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Judge.
Oh. Well, we are determined one day we will win your ballot. One in day. The, Look, in the first out round of the day, we always drop you. We'll see how it goes. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks, guys. man. See y'all. Yeah. Thank you.